Um, welcome everybody um, to the Dismantling Racism in Healthcare and Education panel discussion today, um, an event that is in partnership um, between um, Indigenous Awareness Week and the Indigenous Health Professions Program. So Jessica, Baruta, and myself have spent quite a bit of time trying to get this together and it's really, really lovely to see it come to life and to see all you, you people here today to hear the words that are gonna be shared today. So on behalf of um, the Indigenous Education Program and Indigenous Awareness Week, I would like to welcome you and thank you for being here today. Yo, Gelika Stokla, Nugwa Amlat Sutsalas, Blue Star Woman. Gelikasla Ganyakahaga, Gelikasla Nugwa Gaikanlaha Yalis Lut Sahis. Oh, I'm nervous this morning. <laughs> <laughs> but good morning. I wanted to send greetings to all of you who have come in attendance, uh, everyone who's tuning in online, and all of our wonderful speakers here and all of our partners and organizers. I'm so uh, happy that you're here and engaged and interested. Um, first, I'd like to acknowledge that uh, we are situated on Ganyagahaga territory, a vibrant community, and uh, we're very grateful to be here uh, as welcome guests. And I'd also like to acknowledge uh, today is a very significant day for our Jewish relations. It's, uh, it is Yom Kippur, which is the uh, holiest day uh, for, for their uh, ceremony. So just acknowledging that there are some people who would have liked to attend, but they are in ceremony as well. And for all the people who sent their regrets. Um, so I just wanna give a quick overview of our panel and uh, we'll introduce our speakers and get started. Um, I'm very grateful um, that you all attended and are here to uh, share your perspectives uh, from different many different hats to wear. Um, and um, we'll, we're gonna get started first with Tanya Dick. Um, oh, before that, I just wanted to also acknowledge our partners who helped to plan and organize this event. So the uh, Social Accountability and Community Engagement Office within the Faculty of Medicine. So thank you, Samir and uh, Dr. Razak. The Ingram School of Nursing, thank you very much, Jody Tuck. Um, also the School of Social Work, thank you, Nicole Ives and uh, Wanda Gabriel, who's here, and everyone uh, from those uh, schools and faculties. And uh, just a quick note about our program. So I work for the Indigenous Health Professions Program within the Faculty of Medicine, which is a newer program uh, that we launched this year. Uh, our director is uh, Dr. Kent Saylor, who is a Mohawk pediatrician. And I'm pleased our assistant director, Dr. Dick Menzies, is here today. Um, and our goals are to recruit, support, and train more Indigenous uh, students to become health professionals. Uh, and another part of our mandate is to provide education to all health professionals about the realities faced by Indigenous peoples, uh, our health challenges, and our strengths and our indi Indigenous knowledge systems. So today, this panel is all about sharing about those realities. So I'm very uh, happy to welcome my relative, Tanya Dick, who came all the way from Alert Bay, British Columbia. Uh, far, a very far journey, and she's heading back today to Vancouver. <laughs> so she spent a night here. Um, so Tanya Dick is um, Kwa Kwa Kiwak, uh, from the Zawiza Inu First Nation of Kinkum Inlet, and she's been a registered nurse for 15 years. She spent her entire career in rural and remote nursing, specializing in emergency and indigenous health. Tanya completed her Master's of Nursing in the Nurse Practitioner Program at the University of British Columbia in 2010. And she is currently in her second term as an elected council member for her nation's chief and council. She is also president of the Association of Registered Nurses of British Columbia, which gives her a seat in Ottawa representing British Columbia at the Canadian Nurses Association. And uh, we're pleased to welcome Tanya Dick. I just want to offer this for you for the, following the protocol of the territory. So it's uh, traditional tobacco. So you being here and thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to draw strength from this. Thank you so much, Gayla Kesla. I uh, really want to acknowledge the privilege of being on the traditional territories of the local people. I, well, I'm not even going to try and pronounce that, <laughs> sorry. Nuguam uh, I'm from the Muskomat Zaurang people of Kinkam Inlet. Um, have the privilege of working with many nations in British Columbia with that many hats that I wear, uh, particularly as a nurse. Um, I was uh, 
a little bit nervous about being the first speaker, but we're going to just jump into it. I thought maybe I might have been better last. It always is. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, when I was asked to speak about it, I, I do get to, a chance to talk a lot about um, racism and discrimination in the healthcare system, particularly to nurses. I feel like nurses are the bulk of the healthcare system in terms of numbers. Um, and as a nurse, speaking to nurses, it's really important to try and influence that change and those attitudes. Uh, when we uh, deliver service and in, in, within our practice to ensure that we have safe, adequate care for all. Um, just being an Indigenous woman has been, uh, makes it a little bit more personal. And um, this picture is from the hospital that I work in in Alert Bay. I was born in Alert Bay. My father's Namgis, my mother's from Kinkam Inlet, Zaudeno. Uh, we talk a lot about, oh, we're trying to indigenize and, and uh, do things in the hospital with the nurses and the physicians and all of the staff to try and ensure that we have safe, adequate care, but it's been a difficult road. And we, we talk about uh, how, trying to find answers around that. I was told today that I have a really short period of window to speak and we kind of speaking to, preaching to the choir and looking for more solutions rather than, um, and it's, if I had an answer, I wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be having this uh, session today. So we have to figure this out together and we're going to move forward with that. Uh, we talk a lot about reconciliation in healthcare with the big TRC stuff coming out over the last uh, few years. Uh, there's specific uh, TRC recommendations around healthcare that, that lay tracks for us to follow that make things a little bit easier for us to be creative and initiate um, movement and action around how we can be better in delivering services. Um, the two things that, the thing that I speak a lot about is just my own personal practice, my own personal experience as a registered nurse, a nurse practitioner, and as an Indigenous woman. And I know back in 2008, uh, the nation was a little bit rocked by the media coverage of Brian Sinclair, who died in an emergency department in Manitoba after, I think, 36 hours or some ridiculous amount of time from a completely 100% preventable uh, death. He went septic, and it was basic, based, started as a UTI. And... Um, it came out, uh, the nation was kind of responded a little bit to it. And then the following year, th there's a picture there with a lady in the middle. Her name's Debbie Kuhn. She was up in my area in Port Hardy and was, she has a long history of alcoholism, uh, was really comfortable with trying to make sure that she sobered up enough to travel into the rural and remote communities where there's no access to healthcare services. So she was preparing herself to go into Kinkum and um, hadn't had anything to drink for about five days and uh, ended up, her husband found her in the bathroom kind of acting really strange and slurring a little bit and he thought, what's, he, he knew she hadn't been drinking, brought her into eMERGE and immediately uh, the eMERGE assessment was ETOH, she was under the influence, she was, she was drunk and she needed to sleep it off. After about probably 26 hours from emergency, there was only two nurses there, the merge was full, the beds were full, she was tucked in a corner, she was getting more and more agitated, more acting out, and um, they ended up not being able to keep an eye on her because she was trying, trying to get out of bed and move around, so they called the police, police came, dragged her out, threw her in cell, she'll sleep it off there. Uh, she started getting more agitated, kind of slipping in and out of consciousness, her behaviors became more erratic, uh, they thought, well, there's something wrong here, we gotta bring her back. Ambulance came, literally put their arms under her arms and dragged her out. She had abrasions on her knees and her legs from being dragged and thrown into the ambulance. Got back to the hospital and she was put back in that same bed, same staff issues, wasn't able to keep a close eye on her. It was pouring rain out. She was found, found her way out the door somehow, crossed the parking lot and there's a ditch that was about this full of water. and. Right across the parking lot was the doctor's office. So in, in the huge window was the doctor, uh, the MOA, the secretary, and another staff person watching this lady walk across the parking lot. She was staggering and she actually fell into the ditch and she was just in her hospital gown. That's all she had on. Uh, they didn't come out and help her. They just laughed about, look at that, look how wasted she is. And... It was a stranger walking down the street that saw it and picked her up and, and helped her out and brought her back into Emerge and they changed her and changed her clothes. 
uh, was probably a few hours after that she completely lost consciousness and they realized that she was having some head injury issues, transferred her down to Vic General and she died about two hours later. That lady in the middle is the one who died, the lady on the far side, that's my mom. So this is my family and this is, we have a Brian Sinclair story and with the opportunity that I have to travel throughout the province with my nursing hat and my uh, Indigenous leadership hat. I think last year alone we got to visit about 23 communities. And I'm not exaggerating, every single community had a Brian Sinclair story. That's why we're here today. That's why the change has to happen. And it's that critical that people are dying because of what we're talking about. Unnecessary preventable deaths. And that's why I'm here today, and I will do this every day until we can find some change. And we can't change it ourselves as Indigenous people. We have to do this together. And I think that's why we're kind of grasping onto the reconciliation piece, because we have to walk this walk together. There's not going to be a situation where it's all Indigenous <coughs> delivering healthcare services. We have to learn to work together, we have to learn to be better, and we have to learn to stop letting people die in front of us. And the Namoyut is a Kwakwala word from our nation. It is the kind of word, it's the word that Reconciliation Canada uses. And, and, and I just love it, because we are all one. We are all one and until we can find that space together, particularly in healthcare. It's, we will continue to die as Indigenous people. And I'm looking at my timekeeper. <laughs> yeah, so. I just wanted to share that personal story, and I think it might be a good springboard to jump into to more uh, to the rest of the speakers. It's um, it's been a difficult journey. It's been uh, exhausting, but the allies that we have and the opportunity to travel through all the schools of nursing in British Columbia as well, and the resistance, the absolute resistance I face when we talk about something so simple, of some human nature thing is just to keep people alive. And that's what we are, and we're built to, to the core as nurses to care for and to heal and to lift others up to be healthier and whole again. And when we're participating in a system that allows these types of things to happen, I think we have to find ways to get our brave on and to get really big brave on and start influencing those changes. And I know that the nurses outnumber most of the staff in most institutions, but it, it's a call out for everybody. We all have a role in that. And I think one of my most favorite quotes from my aunt, she's a nurse, registered nurse as well, is that um, we're gonna change the heart of society one nurse at a time. And that's, that was one of the inspirations for me to speak to as many nurses as I can. And I do get the opportunity to s travel throughout BC and speak, and throughout the nation actually. So I think I'm gonna stop there. And thank you very much. I really appreciate this space and this time to have this conversation. It's a difficult conversation. We have to learn to create this space in all of the places that we work, live, and exist in because without this space and this time to have this conversation, change can occur. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tanya, for those words. Uh, I'd like to invite our next panelist uh, up, uh, Wanda Gabriel. Wanda Gabriel is an assistant professor and also the co-director of the QYMSW, the School of Social Work University. Um, she is the director and co-founder of Agenia Kahaga Family Social Enterprise, Back to the Source. In collaboration with her daughters, the social enterprise provides service and consultation on trauma-informed practice healing methods, program development, and therapeutic horticulture. She has developed expertise in helping individuals and families to transcend historical trauma, as well as intergenerational trauma. Combining social work theories with indigenous healing methods, she has walked with many people on this healing journey. Close to 30 years of experience as a social worker and a fierce commitment to decolonizing our minds and relationships, Professor Gabriel has worked with indigenous people across Canada within health and social systems that are consistently dealing with the impact of cultural genocide. 
She brings to these an awareness on the impact of colonization on professional relationships, developing cultural buffers and ways of decolonizing our minds. So please welcome Wanda Gabriel. Wakanarado, Seaguego, Wandanoro Yajets, Kanasadage Rono. Greetings. I give you uh, words in my language of greetings and my name in my language. Uh, I'm really happy to be here to talk about this topic. And I want to thank the organizers and the partners who have come together uh, to speak on dismantling racism. I'm interested in racism, uh, first of all, uh, because I come from Ganyakehage. I live I've lived racism, I've lived oppression, and so when I talk about oppression and colonization, I talk about it from within, and so that's really uh, challenging to talk about it coming from within and having lived it, um, having living, living it, not having lived it, living it, because there's day-to-day -day actions that happen that continue to show me that racism is very alive and well, and colonial attitudes are still very alive and well. Um, my motivation to enter into act academia came from living through the 1990 Oka crisis, uh, staying behind barricades for 78 days. And, uh, and I was a young, young mother raising four children and really didn't understand how that this could be happening in Canada and how racism could become so alive and feeding the general, general population. So that's, that's just a little bit about where my motivation on talking about racism and working on the topic of racism. Um, this topic is loaded and we can't have these conversations without having discomfort and awkwardness. Uh, so, you know, I invite you to dig into moral courage, into your moral courage. And we must give ourselves permission to kindly and respectfully sit with the awkwardness so that we can gain greater insight. So just a starting opening. Um, Cultural gen I want to start with cultural genocide as a starting point. This was declared by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in uh, June uh, 2015. And in order to move, in order to create change, the paradox of change is that we have to accept everything that is. That means we have to accept the ugly, the dark. Um, there's a wonderful side to Canada that everybody loves. We all love beautiful, beautiful geography, the beautiful, peaceful, somewhat peaceful. But the other side is the dark colonial history, the dark colonial oppressive side that is still today. We're not in post-colonial times. We're in colonial times still. Um, so to change what is, we have to accept. We have to accept what is. We have to accept the past, we have to accept the present, we have to accept the good and the bad. And that's not, that's not easy, we have to break through denial. There's denial around the reality of racism. The stories that Tanya shared, the personal experience, I, I would guess that every single indigenous person has a story of such uh, traumatic experiences in our, in our families with the medical, health, education, and social system. So we have to break through denial. And that requires that we understand that the impact of genocide, cultural genocide, has impacted all of our relationships. It hasn't just impacted indigenous people. Um, between, it's impacted between Canadians and indigenous people. The historical context of our, of our um, professions has been impacted. My notes here. So we need to understand how this, these, how it has impacted us, all of us. Um, of course, for us indigenous people, the impacts have been more devastating and more visible and more disruptive to our family systems, to our social fabrics. But it also has affected Canada general population. And how, what does that look like? How, how is that? Um, there's a hierarchical system that has been installed that uses power over people. It imposes, and this creates competitiveness. It creates winners and losers. Um, it creates biases and stereotypes. It creates internalized superiority, which creates judgment among people. 
It's created internalized inferiority, which is shame, which creates shame in who a person is, who's a person's cultural identity. So the internalized superiority, the internalized inferiority ha has this interaction, this dynamic that happens between us and our relationships. And we have to be able to identify those feelings when they come up because they hurt in our workplaces. Also, we look at entitlement. The entitlement that um, internalized superiority creates is that we fall into this rescue syndrome. You know, the policies have been, we got to help and fix the Indian. And so we fall into this rescue syndrome with our entitlement. So the rescue attitude needs to go. And this, these dynamics get played out in our professional relationships, as well as the relationship with the people we work with, with the clients we work with. The judgments, the stereotypes that are placed upon our people, they happen. I want you to ask yourself, how, how do you see this happening in your own workplace? Do you see it happening in your own workplace? So ask yourself that question. Is it happening? Is it happening in my workspace? What do we do? What do we do about it? First of all is, again, as I said, accepting that it is what it is. Uh, first of all, second of all, we have to honestly dig deep within ourselves, each one of us in this room and beyond this room, to look at our own biases. How do they shape our attitude? towards indigenous people. How are my own biases shaping attitude? I can't believe that there isn't a person that's gone unscathed by cultural genocide in terms of biases in this, in this country. So how are my biases in fact affecting my relationship with the people I work with? The relationship I have with the indigenous professional that works with me, how does that, how does that play out? We have to do the opposite of what cultural genocide did. We have to do, which cultural genocide ripped us of our culture, tried to assimilate, tried to um, kill the Indian in the Indian. So we have to support reclaiming of cultural identity in all of our workplaces. We have to infuse the systems with methods that are helping people reclaim their cultural identity because cultural genocide ripped, us, ripped it away from us. So we have to have within the, within the systems methods that are helping to reclaim cultural identity. When we look at the institutions around us, where do we see us as indigenous people? You know, I was really excited to hear that Janelle had taken all the pictures down in the faculty club and put up, <laughs> yay, and put up indigenous art in the faculty club. Kudos. We have to see, we have to see that we are a part of society and enough of the, we only see native indigenous people in the museum or we only see them in the ditch, in the stereotype. Because there's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, indigenous people in the arts uh, that are creating uh, expression and reclaiming of culture through the arts, through music, uh, and within academia. There is a number of indigenous scholars who have published and who are, who are getting their voice out there through our uh, scholar, scholar pu publications. So we have to look at those. We have to look at ways, how do we, where do we see indigenous people within this in, in, in institution? Where? We have the posters up today, but other than that, where? And the language. So we have to have that. Within the hospitals, the, we have to see that it's a, a welcoming place and that we're recognized and that we're lifted up and that we're not put down. And, and, uh, made to feel less than or made to feel not good enough. Healing. Healing has been uh, a key word through the last 15 years. And the healing has been taken on by indigenous people. The healing movement that has been happening for the past 20 years in the indigenous country is amazing and it's beautiful what is happening in people reclaiming, our people reclaiming culture. But is healing only up to indigenous people when cultural genocide has affected everybody? No, healing has to happen for everybody. So we need to be looking at that. We all have the responsibility of healing. There's not one person in Canada who has not been affected by genocide. Uh, just, I'm seeing the time's running out. I wanna talk about what can we do uh, in our professional academic spaces we can start looking at applying a cultural safety approach and a trauma-informed practice approach. 
And this would include cultural humility, first of all. Cultural humility. Who am I and how does my culture interface with yours? Cultural awareness, cultural sensitivity, and cultural competency. So I invite you to explore what of all, the, because of time, explore what, of all, what do those terms mean? What does it mean to apply these terms in your workplace or in your education, in your curriculum? Um, we, want, we want to create spaces so that our people feel safe. And if they feel safe, they're going to be, take, they're going to be, uh, be able to use the services that are there. Our people don't go to the service, they don't feel safe. And they don't feel respected. Um, and we need to be treating people with dignity and respect and trust. We need to look to the TRC's call to actions. There's 94 calls to action. And how many of you know in your disciplines what you're supposed to be doing? We need to be looking at that. And um, there's three major rules that have got locked in oppression in the oppressed. And they are don't talk, don't trust, and don't feel. These are the rules that keep things paralyzed, and that has affected everybody. So to break these rules, and I always, I'm always encouraging people when I'm doing this work, we have to break these three rules. In order to create change, in order to build trust, we need to take risks. Uh, to take risks with one another, to say what's really going on. To take risks with one another, we connect. And when we connect, that equals trust. We begin to build trust. Uh, and when we start trusting, we'll be able to start feeling and start really talking about when that internalized inferiority gets triggered by a professional who's, who's using their internalized superiority, and we can really talk about that. So trust equals feel, and to, to feel equals to be real. And in our language, in Ganyak Gehage, we have umguehuwe, which means to be real. So in order to get to that place, we need to, we need to break those rules by practicing, um, by practicing the don't trust, and the opposite is to trust. So I leave you with that, to be able to trust, to take risks as one another, to say how we feel, um, to connect, and to create change. And I think, I think I'm out of time. So I thank you, everybody. Thank you, Wanda, for that important message and those words, those t uh, reminders. Um, next, I'd like to welcome Susie Goodleaf. Uh, Susie Goodleaf is Ganya Gahaga. She's two-spirited from Ganawagi Territory near Montreal, Quebec. She's a member of the Bear Clan, a proud mother of two children, a grandmother to one, and an auntie to many. She's an alumni from McGill University, where she was formally trained as a psychologist. She has a postgraduate diploma in marital and family therapy and specializes in the treatment of trauma resulting from the multi-generation impacts of the oppression of Aboriginal people. Susie is a second generation residential school survivor and has worked as a consultant with Health Canada, ensuring the safe sharing of experiences during the truth and reconciliation process across Canada. Susie has a love for children and works as a part-time psychologist at the community daycare step-by-step -step early learning center that is inclusion focused and systems based in service delivery. Susie also has a private practice where she sees many nations for individual treatment, couple counseling, family therapy and community consultation. She's a professor at the University of Toronto for the, ma the first master's level social work program in indigenous trauma and resiliency. Please welcome Susie Goodleaf. Those are Wanda's, cool, eh? <laughs> so, Gweze Ogoego, Gasanea Neyujets. I come from the Mohawk Nation of Ganawage, as she said, and I'm really pleased to be here to be sharing amongst my colleagues of uh, great knowledge. Um, I, I'm sharing with you some slides and images as I'm going to be talking because I, that's the kind of learner I am, is that I like to put things into perspective. And as Wanda said, what we're going to be doing today is rule breaking. I love that, right? <laughs> Let's break some rules. Wow. <laughs> so we're going to be talking about how can we do that. And when we look at this image, some of you might think of this as, wow, 
that's a nice painting. And others will think of it as, wow, that's our identity. Right? So it depends where you're coming from. What do you see? And not all of us see the same thing. So when we're coming into situations, when we're coming into even a university, I remember the first time I came to McGill, I was scared to death. Right? Like, what am I going to do here? And who am I to be in these chairs? Because at that time, I felt like, uh, yeah, I'm going to be a psychologist maybe. Right? Am I really going to be a psychologist? Whoa. <laughs> I am, ha ha, no. <laughs> I made it. But when, we first, when I first came in here, I'm like, can I deal with these walls? Can I deal with this institutional way of being? And so when we talk about needing to break these, these barriers, needing to break this way of thinking, it means breaking the rules, right? And how can we as First Nations people be different and be acknowledged as being different in such a structure? So I want to acknowledge my ancestors who come before me, my elders who I've been consulting with, and my daughter in particular who goes to Dawson and I asked her the question, how do we dismantle racism? And she said, well, one of her teachers doesn't want to know her name. It doesn't matter who she is. And I thought, whoa, that's a good place to start. <laughs> right? Let's look at that. Because if we're not actually people, how can we actually create community? How can we actually heal and connect? Right? So that would be like number one, right? How do we create relationships? And this picture is all about relationships. When we look at our values as First Nations people, we're talking about seven generations past and seven generations to come. It's always about what we're doing right at this moment is going to impact us for seven generations. How we are right now is going to impact us and how people were before impact us. So we always have to take into consideration each thing that we do. What does that mean? Who are we and what are our values? And as Wanda was talking about, we've lost a lot of our values because of oppression. We were told that we are no good for who we were. And we're trying to regain that. Who are we? And so we're always trying to figure out who are we within this setting? Can we be who we really are? So when we have times when we can talk about this for 12 minutes, just saying. <laughs> I'm like, okay. anyway, you know, trying to get through, how can we bring this through? So when we have like three, four of us together sharing, well, that's a better picture, right? Right away, it's about inclusion, it's about getting together, it's about everybody sharing. And the next part of it is even better because we're going to get more input from everybody because we can't make solutions by ourselves. So what's this? part of this. So it's really about perspective, right? If we only take a piece, and this is the big part of medicine, I'll look at your eyeball, but not at you, <laughs> right? I'll look at a liver and not at the whole person. So when we're talking about the issues in, in, in community and the issues with diabetes, for example, right? If we only look at the liver and the function of the liver and don't look at the stress level and don't look at the intake, we're really missing the boat. So trauma, as, as Wanda said, creates a barrier. It creates a disconnection between um, the person and themselves. It creates a disconnection between people in relationship. And this is what's happened to us as First Nations people. We've been so oppressed that we've been traumatized with great extent. And we have a lot of, a lot of knowledge about that now with the truth and reconciliation process. There's documentation. We kind of knew it already, but now we have the documentation that proves it, right? So when we talk about breaking rules, I want to just, if some of you are med students, to get a real close idea of what this is about. I call it protective defiance. And it means that sometimes we're protecting ourselves because things are pretty scary or there's a perceived scare. So we know the fight flight reaction, right, from psychology, from neuroscience now. And we know that when somebody is afraid of something or perceived danger, that they're going to react and they're going to react in a way that might seem strange. So I have physicians, when I consult with physicians, I say, I don't know why my patients just don't take the medications. They're just supposed to take the medication, and they're not. And so now they're non-compliant clients. And I'm like, oh, yeah? Well, you got a white coat on. <laughs> <laughs> right? And so right away, it's, it's a, oh. I was just given a bunch of papers to sign, 
<laughs> by Jessica about McGill, I have to do this, the blah, 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 okay. And I always freeze when I have to do paperwork, especially government paperwork. I'm like, nah, I don't want to do it. <laughs> well, you want to get it paid? I have to fill the work. So there's an automatic reaction towards anything that's institutional. Mm -hmm. So when you're saying get your paper in on time and you have that attitude, everybody's going to be like, yeah, right. So it's important to recognize that those <laughs> are protective defiant behaviors and they need to be honored. That that's a way of saying that, whoa, wait a minute, I might be scared about something. And so some of the behaviors, you know, not showing up, how come my client doesn't show up? Oh, well, let's talk about that, right? How come you're making promises and not fulfilling them? So there's lots of different ways that being late or avoiding or gossiping, these are all considered or can be considered protective defiance ways. But we need to look beyond that. So I work at a daycare and a lot of times kids will react in a certain way and we don't know what it is because they don't have the sophisticated language, right? So the, the kids will be reacting and our job is to figure out what are they saying? What are they saying without saying it? And our job is to be with them as they try to figure it out. Well, that's what we have to do as healthcare providers, is that sometimes what you're saying isn't necessarily what you're saying, right? We have to look beyond it and look, look deeper to that. So some things that I think are really helpful in terms of practice or good practice for healthcare professionals are a few things here. Now you have the medicine wheel on all of our, our posters, right? But do people really even know what the medicine wheel is, right? It's taking into consideration the four parts of self. And the part of self that's often left out within healthcare system is the spiritual. You know, what's been brought here why I'm holding tobacco is the connection. I've just made an agreement with the creator that I'm going to speak my heart the best that I can. We've just made a commitment. So why is it missing in the healthcare profession? Why is that not honored? Right? So it's about looking at, and you know, we get really kind of weird about, well, you can't have things on your head and you can't have crosses and you can't have, like it's all about don't, op don't push on your belief system on other people, and that's important. However, what is your belief system and not acknowledging that there's a need for a connection, or else who are we? So when we look at the medicine wheel, it gives us all the teachings, but some good practices that help, help people make connection. So when you're working in whatever field that you're working in, it's about helping people make connections, right? We have moms in social work who can't, manage because there's so much strain and so we take her kids away what right why not give her some support so maybe she can do what she, you know needs to be done instead of taking away so how do we make connections how do we provide support how do we help people make connections within interdisciplinary work together avoid avoid generalizing about people's experiences and needs but know the historic issues Right? So when you go, okay, you're First Nations, I know. Okay, well, you know there's, there's like a lot of First Nations just sitting here in this room, right? We probably have, what, 10 different First Nations? So each of us has a different story, but a similar assimilation process. So knowing that, just know that it's different, but there's similarities. Identify current factors that may be affecting well-being. So just like I said about the diabetes, right? It's not just blood sugar level, it might be about that there's 20 people living in one house and there's so much stress. Maybe that's it. And look at that issue, right? It may be that there's some family violence that's happening and th this person is trying to manage it. Maybe that's the issue. So looking beyond what's presented. Focus on resiliency and positive coping strategies. So I think the really important piece is that we're First Nations and we're in a difficult time right now because all of our levels of everything are higher than everybody else. So right now we're winning. Yeah. <laughs> Just saying, right? You gotta flip it, you gotta look at it different. <laughs> but we're in a place where we're in crisis and because of that crisis, we're able to look at what's happening. Now the advantage, and Wanda was talking about that, is that First Nations people are being oppressed from people who have been oppressed, right? So the wars and the judgment are coming from a place where people didn't resolve their trauma, so they brought it here. And now we've gotten it, 
The advantage is that as First Nations people, we're the last, in a sense, to be oppressed. So we're the closest to our historic knowledge. That's why we're being able to bring it forward. Yeah, right? <laughs> Gotta flip it. Gotta flip it. Develop a community family approach to supporting healthy, healthy, healthy living. It's got to be in a family. It's got to be in a group. We can't do it by ourselves. And now neuroscience shows us that over and over again. Attachment research shows that the only way to make attachment is through connection. That when I connect with you and I give you a hug, I'm going to produce some, some endorphins that are going to make me feel love. And that's what's going to help. So it's through connection. And then make linkages with other services. Please, medical people, work together. <laughs> right? Work together. And when we can have a multidisciplinary approach to things, we're going to do a lot better. We really will. But how do we make those connections within this box system that we work in, right? You have to make the referral, give it to somebody, then you have to wait three weeks, and then you have to wait another three weeks to get an appointment to get, whoa, okay, okay, can we sit down and talk together? Is there a way? And that's the whole structure. How can we change that box? Can we do it in a different way? So that's a challenge. That's what we're going to figure out, right? <laughs> so that's what I have to share with you today. So thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Susie, for those perspectives. Uh, that was wonderful. I'm pleased uh, and happy to welcome Dr. Salim Razak. Uh, Salim Razak is a pediatric critical care medicine physician at the Montreal Children's Hospital, where he has practiced since 1996. He is a professor of pediatrics, he's a medical educator, and the director of the McGill Faculty of Medicine's Office of Social Accountability and Community Engagement. He is passionate about issues of equity and diversity in health professions and education, which intersect with his professional practice, work as an educator, and work as a researcher uh, in medical education. So please welcome uh, Dr. Rezak. Thank you. Um, it's uh, interesting to follow three so eloquent speakers. Uh, I don't think I'm going to say anything that uh, is really new, but perhaps I can offer um, my perspective, my own personal perspective uh, as a clinician and as an educator. So I wasn't really sure what voice to speak in uh, at, this, at this talk, you know? Should I speak as a clinician? Should I speak as a medical educator? Uh, and the one that's really at the bottom of it all is really, should I speak as a brown boy? And, uh, you know, most of the people in this audience are younger than I am, uh, so you're, you're okay with brown and you're going boy? No. <laughs> Come on. Uh, but uh, suffice it to say that in my head, I will always be 15 years old studying for a calculus exam and uh, thinking about getting into medicine. Uh, so I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't really uh, separate any of those things. So I think what I'm going to do is speak in all three. So the first thing I thought I would tell you about is when this brown boy discovered his white privilege uh, and, uh, and uh, what that meant for the work that I do. And it was a good thing. So uh, I... Uh, you know, I grew up, I'm grateful for the family I come from. Uh, the family that I come from uh, told me that I could do whatever I wanted. Just do medicine first or we'll kill you. <laughs> uh, 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 but there was also very easy conversation around, um, around history. Uh, you know, I am I'm, I'm from the Caribbean. I am a product of Okay, African slavery ended, then there was Indian indenture, then there was a big colonial experience, and uh, you know, I'm, I grew up understanding myself as a product of this global system of colonization and oppression, and to you know, transcend it, not to, not to, to revel in it. 
uh, or to uh, roll around in it, but to, to understand it. But um, there was missing conversation about uh, indigenous people in there. And um, when I uh, really, really felt it was uh, when I had the privilege of participating in a um, high performance camp, which is elite athletes from all over the country, indigenous athletes, about 16, 17 years old from all over the country, uh, coming to McGill and the message that we're sort of seeing is to, to get people interested in, in health professions and, and so on. But I, was, I always love watching um, adolescents interact with each other and interacting, um, you know, they're, they're doing things like flirting with each other and beginning to pair off and all this kind of stuff. And probably because my own adolescence was so tortured and awkward, it's fun for me to watch all this stuff happening. Um, and, you, you know, so the, they were doing that. And um, it was really, really cool to see. Um, and then I went to my car to go home after the, after the uh, sort of the, the stuff that I did in this camp. And I, I started to cry. And I started to cry because I think that I saw, uh, I saw simultaneously that these were a bunch of 16 and 17 year olds just trying to get in each other's pants, um, which is totally fine and great. Um, but there was also, um, you know, like 400 years of history there. And uh, I think, I think, you, you know, sometimes when, when we settlers do this crying thing, um, it starts to be all about us instead of the oppression. But I think it was a good thing for me because it made me a better teacher. Uh, it made me understand uh, my settler privilege. And I think it's a, it, it, it is the, at the heart of the conversation. My journey, my understanding of what it means to be a Canadian must also change. Uh, if I am to be truthful and reconciliatory. So I have to develop self-awareness as a cultural being, uh, as someone with privilege. It was a privilege to be told that we'll kill you if you don't do medicine first. That, that's a privilege. Uh, as a medical educator and as a Canadian, as I said. So the other story that I wanted to give you is about Mary and her bone marrow transplant. So I work with very sick kids, you know. Uh, actually, Mary did not survive, okay? Mary came to the intensive care unit uh, very, very uh, sick with a complication of having had a bone marrow transplant, a complication from that. And she was uh, from a Cree nation. Uh, but I learned so much from interacting with this family. Um, and. Um, the reason I learned so much from interacting with this family is because it was so different than uh, I had ever seen before. So we would have big, heavy conversations about major, major things um, related to Mary's treatment. And, um, you know, so I'm the doctor, I'm supposed to go into the room and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm accompanied by a social worker and um, <clears throat> an interpreter. and. In the room, I walk into the room, and there are, I'm not kidding, at least 10 imposing women, okay? So everybody, oh, it's a grandmother, it's a grandmother, but there were like six of grandmothers, but it's, it, turns out that it, it turns out that it wasn't, you know, the, the, the term is imprecise. It, it's, it's, everybody's related, and everybody's a woman because uh, as my, uh, as the interpreter said, when it's stuff related to children, the power of women really come out uh, in this culture. And everybody had to have their say. And I had to get used to something that I'm not used to, because you can appreciate that I talk very fast. And, um, and uh, in, in, uh, in this culture, everybody gets their say. There's a lot of silence. There's no tolerance for silence on the part of Salim Razak because that's not how I was raised. I want to rescue you when there's a silence. Uh, and I had to learn to listen. And um, I think, you know, stepping back, you know, and it's very sad, you know, Ma Mary did not survive. Um, but what I saw there was how the matriarchy could work and how it could be a wonderful way of looking after 
children, for instance. So there, um, my, my sort of goal, uh, what I learned there was about um, the kinds of skills that I want to build in myself and in the people that I teach uh, uh, around um, very technical kinds of skills. So skills around um, communicating across social distances and um, understanding what it's like to communicate across social distances. So the, the next thing that I wanted to talk about is that I really think that we cannot have this conversation in healthcare without understanding structural racism, okay? So this is, the, this is an interesting story. People will laugh um, at this. Um, so I was working with an indigenous colleague in Winnipeg um, and we were going to apply for a grant. We never did get around to applying for the grant, but we were going to apply for a grant to study the experiences of indigenous medical students in, in, in racist curricula, basically. Um, and, um, you know, we were sort of taught, you know, we're mulling, we're being terribly intellectual about it. We're sort of mulling about what, what sort of, what frameworks will, might we apply to, to the methodology and so on. So I said, well, why don't we think about post-colonial theory. And um, he said to me, oh, they left. Um, <laughs> and uh, and, and, um, and uh, I got it. I got, I understood, I understood why we have to, uh, why, why there has to be an, a, a specific training and, and understanding around indigenous health, for instance. Because the other side of it is, right, so where I come from, what I would say is that you can't, it, it, uh, human rights are a package. You can't be about uh, one thing but not the other. Uh, uh, you cannot, uh, you, you, it's a package or else it falls apart. That is true, but what what we are experiencing here is um, is not past tense. Um, the um, the institutions that I work in and that I revel in are part of the um, are actually part of the colonization experience. Actually, uh, right this minute, um, and you know I'll. I'll, I'll I'll give you an example. Um, I was involved very tangentially in the, um, the work to try and uh, allow parents to come down on medivacs from up north. Uh, mostly I was involved because I'm the director of the intensive care unit and sort of having someone like that say it's a bad thing when it's kind of like always been a bad thing, it, which is silly, uh, it, you know, is helpful. But I have seen, so I have seen uh, so many instances over the last 20 years of, uh, of, of children having negative psychological effects from not being accompanied with their parents, with their critical illness, and I can't even believe, I can't believe that it's now that we, you, you know, now that we're doing this, because we've always talked about this in my hospital anyway, as sort of in a kind of a disempowered way, we can't change it, we can't change it. But lo and behold, here it's changing. So that's Paul Lucy's medevac. I think um, uh, an, another sort of thing is to think about our indigenous students. So I have had a, the privilege of working with an indigenous student named Raven, who we were rounding together in the ICU uh, with our team. So Raven is not uh, visibly indigenous uh, to, to, to people. Uh, uh, and, um, you know, we had about three patients from, you know, that magical place called Up North, uh, which, uh, you know, code word for indigenous, and they all had the same respiratory infection, uh, they all had collapsed right upper lobe lungs, and it was sort of like kind of humorous in a way that they were all very similar. So we had uh, literally three patients. But as we were rounding, the team started to use very othering language about why is this happening? Why, why are there three patients in this unit that, ha that come from a small demographic population? And uh, using very othering language, and I was, as a teacher, getting very aware that Raven was there and, and the others didn't know that she was indigenous and, and so on. So I actually talked to her about it afterwards. And I said, um, Raven, how do we change this? How do we how do we deal deal with this with with the uh, with the team? 
And, uh, and uh, what we did was we actually um, disclosed with the team that, that Raven was from a, an indigenous community and, and were able to debrief the othering language that was used on rounds uh, with, about those patients um, in order to have everybody go to a better place of understanding as they move through. Last thing that I'll talk about is teaching about the weight of oppressive history. So I just, I, I have to work this in because it's such a big part of my, I just became the father of twins. So they're just starting to eat cereal now, okay? Which they're not supposed to because they're supposed to do it at four months, but anyway, it's, can't, can't wait. <laughs> uh, uh, so, so they're just starting to eat cereal now, but do you, do you know the history of infant cereal? Is that a lot of it comes from work that was done at the University of Toronto at Sick Kids Hospital? Uh, the, so Pablum is, a, is is the first one. But the the doctor who um, worked a lot on designing Pablum was involved in um, you know worked for Indian Affairs and was involved in um, nutritional studies with um, Indigenous children uh, that involved starvation of Indigenous children. So when I uh, look at my son and daughter, who are going to be having indi having cereal, just little rice cereal. I want to consciously know that um, part of the knowledge that put all the good vitamins in there comes from work on the starvation of indigenous children, right? So that we have to teach that to our medical students. They have to understand that as part of their history as well, in addition to all the good stuff. Uh, they have to understand that as part of their history. So the ultimate goal for me is about being right-sized. So that's the idea that, you know, um, our institutions are actually part of the colonization experience. They also do great things, but they're also part of the colonization experience. We have to develop critical consciousness in our, uh, teacher, uh, in our teachers and in our students. And in the end, it is about internalizing that medicine and its constituent parts is, I, I made sure to put is, not was, um, <clears throat> integral to the colonization experience. And we have to have the consciousness and courage to name the oppression of indigenous people in order to develop the courage to change it. So thank you very much. Great, thank you so much, uh, Salim uh, Razak, for those words. And um, at this time, we're gonna start with um, questions and answer just to stimulate more of a discussion. I do have some sent from me in advance uh, via email, but um, if some of you have some questions right away, we'd love to get the audience engaged. Um, for, I'm gonna ask my colleague Samir to go with the microphones um, because we are live streaming, so just in order for the uh, the people online who are watching can hear it. Just please speak directly into the mic. Um, I have one person back here. And um, yeah, I'll start with one of the questions that were sent in advance. So this work is tiring and emotionally taxing, especially when the work is in proximity to one's own lived experience. What advice do you have for those of us who are doing this work in fields of healthcare and education, uh, especially in academia, with respect to self-care and community care? So any of whoever would like to take the lead. <laughs> um, do you have the microphone? Okay, you can speak from there. Okay. Um, I guess when it comes to working in your own community in terms of a social worker or psychologist and dealing with your own family oftentimes as we're talking about this. So for First Nations working in First Nations communities, you really need to have a support network. You need to have those people that you can talk to and, and process with in order to debrief because you're going to be triggered by the stories that you're hearing. And the, the, the kind of ethics that are present for different or, um, uh, professions is a little bit different when you're talking about rural communities. And so we have to be able to look at it within a family and systems frame so that you're not um, labeling things as much. It's more about how we're going to deal with this issue. So it really is about how we frame things. I think when it comes to an educational institution, it's a lot about um, making those connections and realizing that um, 
what you're doing and how it's impacting, I think talking with your class is a really good idea. You were saying that, right? You, mm -hmm. you debrief with the class. Mm -hmm. um, that, that's a piece of, yeah. I think uh, it, with it working within, uh, being indigenous, working within an academic setting, I think we really have to have uh, our own self-care uh, support system, our support circle uh, with other indigenous people or other people uh, of color to talk about the ongoing colonial mindset that happens, whether it's in the classroom or whether it's in the team, but to be able to say, this just happened and it's really triggering my, my internal an internalized inferiority and I don't want to get stuck in that place of powerlessness. So we have to have a space where we can really talk about it and create a, a higher level of consciousness. I think with, I think back to the story I shared with you working in my own community. I work in my own community that I was born in, the hospital that my aunt died in. Uh, we're very close knit in that small rural area. So the three hospitals we're very close knit as nurses. These are friends that I had sleepovers with, barbecues with, came to my family events. And when I read the inquest, and my aunt passed through 17 people and the majority of them were nurses, my entire kind of support system and ship just overturned. It was like, how can people so close to me do that to somebody I love so much? And I had to read my Facebook friends list changed a little bit, <laughs> but I, I had to, realize that the importance of the social social support internally as indigenous people was so important to me just to maintain my own self and that before different directions of the medicine wheel but just as important to me was finding that social support externally with the non-indigenous people because mm -hmm. it really reminds me and it really grounds me in the fact that this change that we desperately need is 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 possible mm -hmm. so it, it, that having that uh, social support for you guys who are non-indigenous to indigenous professionals or n on a personal scale and a professional scale is so important. Mm. Be a part of that change and that support and holding them up. Mm. I think um, when you asked the question, the, the first thing that came to mind was um, the notion of passing uh, within an institution. Um, you know, uh, as I have moved up in so sort of more administrative positions. I, I mean, it's become kind of wider and wider, uh, and uh, and uh, mailer and mail, you know, all, anything, anything you want to say, uh, straighter and straighter, wider and wider, all the the whole thing, um, and um, and uh, e there's this tension that goes on between accomplishing something which means being strategic, being careful with what you say, uh, thinking about the audience uh, in order to get your thing done, and just wanting to be a, rage a little around the injustice that's going on. Um, and it can feel a little inauthentic. And I think that that's, you know, because I've had, had the experience of having a lot of people, um, you know, come to me with that, that kind of conversation. And I think what truly helps is to actually seek out people that you can talk to about it um, and to, um, uh, to uh, remember that it's, it's not only going to be people that look like you that, 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 that are going to be helpful in those, those kinds of conversations. There's a lot of hidden stuff going on that... Uh, that is that that is worth it. So have an open mind to who to talk to as well. Um, and uh, the, finally, the last thing for me is um, the the notion of teaching and paying it forward is is kind of a thing that I can get into. It's a bit. It might, I might even say it's a bit the spiritual side of it. Yeah. Uh, we have a question over here. Say go to all the panelists and Yongoa for all your sharing. Um, our particular challenge in the urban setting, and as well as for all the uh, new practitioners, especially in a metropolitan setting, is that they're going to be faced with upwards of 30 different nations trying to access services. Uh, so I'm wondering if you have faced that in your own career paths, and how would you say to a new student how to not do a pan-Indian approach to culturally relevant services? Thanks. Yeah. I would say that um, 
it's really important to be uh, curious and not to generalize, to be authentic, to be real, to, to admit to not knowing, to admit to being naive. I don't know all the nations of, of the city or of, of Canada. So in a kind, uh, patient way of being inquisitive and curious and asking in a, in a good way, in a kind way, I think is key. And even, just even to all of, like all of us have different territories around Quebec, just in Quebec. Mm. Who are your neighbors? Do you know who your neighbors are? Do you know who your indigenous neighbors are that, that are along your county or along your municipality? Do you know? Just start there, looking, looking in your own backyard. Who's, who's my neighbor? Just to be curious. I've got another question from, that was sent in advance. Uh, I'm curious if uh, Salim would find this one interesting. So um, in quotations, diversity, equity, intersectionality have all seemed to become buzzwords in some institutional spaces and have often supplanted race, racism, systemic oppression, colonialism. How do you have an open conversation about these issues while still challenging people to push their understanding? I, I love this question. I love to say the word intersectionality because I actually don't really know what it means, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm intersected. Um, you know, and I think I'm interlocking oppressions and all that kind of stuff. But uh, there, I, think, I think what we have to do is we have to look at the usefulness of terms, right? They're used for certain reasons and then they have places where they're not useful anymore. And I think that um, one of the issues, is, so, thing, so having had a longer perspective of teaching, we see students now say, so if I, so I, I put up a slide sometimes which shows the different life expectancies between indigenous people in Australia, New Zealand, and Canada. And uh, I put up that slide and I ask students why do they think that that is so, and you know, the genetic explanation which we love in medicine can't work because you know these are three very genetically distinct populations and so on and uh, the students now will say the colonization experience right that the, the, they would not have said that in 2010 okay so I, I i think that what we have to do is uh we have to um and, and it's a lot of teaching that's gone on around that kind of stuff right but um, I think that we have to get over um, this thing where we don't want to make people feel bad. To, to, to learn about privilege and oppression and marginalization, you actually have to feel bad a little bit. And, and you have to be a skillful teacher. Uh, you have to engage in skillful faculty development so that you, you know, don't destroy people when they're learning something, but that they actually learn something. And I think that that was actually a challenge with colleagues. Um, be, because, uh, so in the, in the first year medical class, I do this thing called the privilege walk, which probably many of you know, where you ask people to go forward and backwards depending on their answers to certain questions. You know, uh, if you've ever felt unsafe at night, take a step back, and you know, different, different kinds of things. And um, <clears throat> my colleagues, when I first started doing it, d did tell me things like, why are you making these kids feel bad? And they don't do that anymore. Um, and the students never, they, they were never having trouble with that. And, and I think that those kinds of experiential things are the, it, it's the way to understand inside here um, just like me in that watching 17-year-olds watching flirt, mostly because I'm jealous of them because, again, my 17-year-old status was not very good, um, but watching them flirt helped me understand, um, you know, white settler privilege. Is there any more from the audience who's uh, ready to go? I just want to say one quick thing on that one around the academia. I've got the chance to go to different schools of nursing and from a director's perspective or creating these curriculums and whatnot, they're not properly resourced. <laughs> they mandate these programs, indigenous programs, mm -hmm. but they won't uh, have a budget to bring elders right. in or honorariums to do it properly for us to be able to tell our stories and to move away from making it a token kind of uh, mm -hmm. presentation, rather make it real and allow that space for us to bring that story forward. Mm -hmm. Good point. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you so much. Um, I'm really grateful to be here. And I'm curious if you have ideas or thoughts about um, possibly even like points of intervention for solidarity and co uh, coalition building between indigenous folks and black folks, um, especially in these like really colonial institutions that were impacted by and uh, different but also similar ways. And so I'm wondering if you have thoughts about where those points may be. Um, because I feel like that is a thing I'm just also thinking through as well. And so what does it mean to like be doing that work in, in these institutions, but then also outside of them? Um, yeah. Did everyone hear the question? She's asking about building solidarity between the black community and indigenous uh, allies as well. And allies or just indigenous and black? No, no, just... Black folks and indigenous folks. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I say that in particular as well because I think there's one thing that we see in spe specifically um, in academia are the ways in which black folks and indigenous folks are, are erased under the umbrella of racialized or people of color. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm particularly interested in those specific relations. Mm -hmm. Good question. I think I'll maybe just touch on this a little bit, but I think that there's, there's always a great experience when you work together, mm -hmm. right? So when we have people who have experienced similar, that we can create a brotherhood or a sisterhood within that and feel like, okay, I'm supported in this and it's really similar and, and how can we work together? Now you've just created two groups that are, are, are working together. As long as we're not as well creating um, a racist way of being. So we have to be careful of yeah. that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So that, oh yeah, well, you're just white, you're not allowed to come. So when you ask about you know, solidarity and, and our supporters and our, our people who are there with us, it's really important to bring them in as well because the world is so diverse. Um, so whenever we can, we make walks together. So the gay walk, right? People, whoever wants to be in the parade, let's do it, right? And so that's a way of kind of bringing people together. But when it comes to the day-to-day -day of what does it feel like, we need those people who can really understand that. So there's... There's different ways, so. May I, um, I, it's an excellent uh, question. I think um, one important thing is to have people listen to each other and understand, have a place where people can listen to each other and understand each other's histories, right? And, and where it comes from. And, um, you know, uh, the hierarchy exists we didn't create it, right? There, so there will be privilege within there as well that, that may be hard to recognize uh, for a black person, for instance, uh, or for uh, an, uh, someone, an indigenous person um, that, that needs to be um, recognized in the, in the conversation. From a program perspective, I think another thing that we need to really think about is the interventions and the things we're trying to teach people are all very similar, but they get expressed in different contexts. So we can share and work about developing the material together and uh, then um, work at, about contextual. So if you're teaching anti-oppressive theory uh, or anti-oppression, anti um, you can teach that in multiple contexts and it will have to express itself differently in different contexts. But we can work on that material together and we can share building that together. Mm -hmm. I would like to add to that. I think what's important too within uh, academic settings or institutional settings is to create a community space mm -hmm. that is solely dedicated for community and uh, relationship building. An exa a great example of uh, a medical institution uh, creating community space is uh, Wabano Health Center in Ottawa that has, a, you know, they have a clinic and they have a cultural space. They have a circular uh, room made out of cedar uh, and the, you know, they have doctors, nurses, they have community workers, they have elders, they have traditional, they have medicine. So creating a community space where people can come together and, and be in a spiritual space or community space to, to share, uh, to share on the difficult things that we, we experience together. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank, you. Thank you. Another question here from... Uh Uh, my language, that means uh, thank you everyone for your words. 
Um, it was particularly interesting to hear um, your perspective, uh, Dr. Razak, considering how I was in that cohort of uh, high spirit or uh, eagle spirit campers. <laughs> it, you know, very interest, interesting perspective, nonetheless. But I think one one of the things that I very much took from what you were talking about was you went into your car afterwards and you you cried. And I think that in everyone, st everyone's stories, we all come from a place, or you all came from a place of trauma in certain instances. And I think that when we, as indigenous peoples, when we communicate trauma, it's, it can be, we're very emotional about it. You know, we, we shed tears, we get shaken up. And in the professional and the colonial environment, that can be seen as unprofessional, yet that is how we communicate as indigenous peoples. How do you think, what do you think needs to happen for our, allies and also in the professional environment to accept that way of communicating from us? Yeah, very good question. We just do it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm gonna, a simple answer. <laughs> I, I'm going to claim uh, pediatric privilege because pediatrics, you got to cry. <laughs> I mean, you, uh, or, and you also got to, you got to butt heads with the baby who's, you know, sick as a dog on chemo, but still trying to strangle himself in his IV to reach for the toy, right? Like there's, 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 there's some built-in stuff in pediatrics that, that um, allows, if, we do, if we're able to say it in a more meaningful way, professional, that allows for boundary crossing, right? Um, and, and is part of the way we practice. But, but I get it, because I actually got a little emotional there. Like, I, was start, I, I, I didn't even think it was going to happen. I, 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 but I started thinking about the episode, and then I started to get a little emotional. I said, well, pull yourself together. Um, uh, but I, I, I think that what we have to do is permit the emotion as a tool of practice and of healing, right? And it's actually pretty skillful. Right, like uh, I always joke with my fellows. Uh, I say, you know, if you walk into a room and you're crying and the mother's comforting you, well, maybe, maybe that's not about. That's not what we should do. But if you're actually empathizing properly and building a relationship, that's okay. So. And I guess I'd like to add to when we're talking about the the three rules that we learned about: don't speak, don't trust, and don't feel. The institution embodies that, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So we need to really look at, as individuals, we really need to do our own work because we should have access to our feelings when something is upsetting. We should have access to our words when we need to speak about something that's difficult, mm -hmm. right? We should be able to access our connection. So again, when we look at institution, maybe that's not actually the right way to do it. But empathy might be the better way, right? So, and I know that when, when I work with, you know, uh, medical professionals or, or police or, and they've, they've held it in so long that the PTSD is just overwhelming, mm -hmm. right? We know that that's not good. But to be weak is seen as to feel. What's wrong with that? Mm -hmm. Right? So... Looking at feeling as not a weakness, but as a, as a truth of human existence, then that's a different perspective and that's a value of that medicine wheel, right? Because one of the components is emotion, the other is cognitive, the other is physical, and the other is spiritual. So if we don't have that balance, then we're out of balance mm -hmm. and we're just big heads walking around. <laughs> <laughs> Running out of time, unfortunately, because uh, I really feel this discussion could keep on going for much longer than we have. Um, but I'd like to just um, say Nyalgoa uh, Gelakasa. Um, thank you to everyone who came and the speakers. And um, there's a lot of questions that still were left unanswered. But uh, if you have any closing words or thoughts uh, for the speakers here, please uh, share that with us now. And, and uh, thank you again from, from my heart to yours for being here, sharing your truth. Thank you. Thank you. And I would just like to take a moment to um, say doyak sitnesam to everybody here. Thank you in my language. Um, and doyak sitnin luam to my relative here from 
the West Coast as well and having a little piece of home um, in this institution, which is very good medicine for me and, um, and very happy to have been able to plan this event together. Indigenous Awareness Week is amazing. I'm very excited for it to be two weeks. I'm speaking and introducing and emceeing a lot of things, so I really appreciate Jessica being here and just taking that right away and letting me sit and find my peace just doing some beadwork and listening. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> and so I just wanted to say that as well. And just a quick little reminder, um, in speaking about solidarity, we have an event tomorrow um, to be in solidarity and support. It is a, an event in partnership with the Black Student Network um, that will be a panel discussion from 2 to 4 at, uh, the Thompson, at Thompson House Ballroom. And then after that will be a closed event to Black, Indigenous, and People of Color open mic night to share expressions and um, of, in different forms to just be there in support and solidarity of each other after a very heavy conversation that we will have beforehand. So I hope to see you all there, and I hope you all get a chance to check out some books outside. Um, Jeff from Good Minds is set up out there with some amazing books, all health-related, that he tailored just for our event today. He's come all the way from Six Nations. If you haven't heard of Good Minds, it is a website, family-owned, Indigenous-owned from Six Nations. So if you're looking at getting resources for your department or personal, um, or in whatever sense, books for children, um, purchasing from Good Minds is putting back into the Indigenous community as well. Um, and he has also generously offered um, to be able to offer a 10% discount today for, um, for everybody attending who would like to purchase some books outside. Mm -hmm. so, Doyak Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say thank you. Uh, I'm not used to such a big panel, and I usually come around circle with my story about my aunt. She had zero alcohol in her system and had a head injury by falling in the bath near the bathtub. So I have the privilege, and it's such it's difficult for me to get my brave on and step into that uh, emotional space and hurt that we experienced as a family. But that's my commitment to the profession. That's my commitment to society to continue to step into that discomfort. And I really encourage all of you to do the same. So thank you very much. And I feel very privileged to be here. Mm -hmm. I will say nyawakoa. Thank you very much for your attentiveness and your participation and the organizers. And um, I'm just going to say, uh, please break the rules. Yes. So please break those three rules. Nyawa. And I want to thank you for having me here and, and to be such privileged people here. Um, I want to, when I look at new students or even people who are coming back and learning and continuing to learn, I get very excited because it means that it's continuing, mm. right? It means that we're moving forward and uh, we just need to keep doing that and breaking the rules as part of it. Thank you. And, and again, I, I want to say my, my thanks. Uh, I, again, I see a lot of young people in the audience. Um, you know, uh, some of you will be in health professions programs training. Um, as when we join health professions programs, it's a little different than critical thinking. It's actually agreeing to think a certain way. Um, and, um, and what we need to do is break the rules a little yeah. and uh, teach a little bit about critical thinking. And what I would ask you guys to do uh, in your classrooms is challenge your teachers every two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>